What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Murph's Boston Sports Talk. I am your host, James Murphy, a.k.a. Murph. And in today's episode, we are going to dive into the truth about the Patriots' 29 to nothing shutout or the Detroit Lions on Sunday. Uh, on Sunday, Yeah, last Sunday. I was going to say Sunday night. Nope. It's a good win. It's a great win. Let's call it a great win. Why not? And people are excited. Ooh, the Patriots put up 29 points. Ooh, the defense gave up zero points to the line. Wow. But we really got to dive into those stats and, and really uncover the truth about what really happened that game. Because I'm not as impressed with it as a lot of people are. I'll be honest. I'm not. But I'm going to really get into it in a few moments, but let me continue with the intro. Today, we're also going to explore a couple trade options for the Patriots that they should explore with the trade deadline coming up in week nine. So only a couple weeks away from the trade deadline, to be honest. I remember years ago, like eight years ago, I think it used to be like week six. So like the trade deadline was this week, uh, a few years ago. Now it's week nine, gives team a little bit more time to figure out what they're trying to do or where they're at per se. But yes, we're going to be talking about some potential trade options for the Patriots as we do inch, inch, inch closer to the trade deadline. And then, of course, we're going to give a quick preview about the Patriots and the Cleveland Browns matchup on Sunday. So with all that out of the way, hopefully you guys had a fantastic weekend last weekend. Hopefully you just had a fantastic week this week. And hopefully you have some good uh, good things planned this weekend. I know for me... I will be at a card show. I'll be at the Quincy, Massachusetts uh, Sports Card Expo on Sunday, which I'm very excited for. And we have a bunch of uh, different videos coming out on the YouTube channel if you haven't already checked it out, if you haven't already subscribed. We got a TGA submission reveal. We got a box battle between me and Mrs. Murph. And then, of course, we have episode 164 coming out next Friday. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves here. We're on episode 163 right now, and I appreciate you guys so much for downloading, listening, and enjoying Murph's Boston Sports Talk. And if you listen to this on YouTube, thank you so much for clicking on the video. Please make sure you smash the thumbs up button, comment down below, and of course, subscribe to the channel if you're new or have not considered subscribing just yet. But I'm very excited to dive into today's episode because... uh, People are just telling me that the Patriots had a resounding win. And you know what? 29 to nothing may seem like that to the naked eye. But let's really dive into the statistics here. Now, I must uh, must first say that the Patriots do favor in most statistics. Yards, passing yards, rushing yards, you know, first downs, third down, efficiency, all that good stuff. I'm going to go through all of it. And they do lead in, I'd say, a lot of um, the majority of them. But, but, actually they should, before I even get into the buts, they should, if you're winning 29 to nothing, you should have more yards, you should have more passing yards, you should have more first downs, da 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 But again, 29 to nothing the statistics between the Lions and the Patriots are a little bit tighter than you may think. So obviously, let's just start with the most blatant one. We've already talked about the score. 29 nothing favors the Patriots. Boom, check mark, Patriots. whoop de doo All right, total yards. Patriots, 364. Lions, 312. Only trailed by 52 yards in a game where they scored zero points. So total yards. They, they went up the field three times. 300 yards. They went up the field three times, but they weren't able to capitalize. Could it be because of the one interception thrown? Could it be because of the fumble that was lost? I don't know. But th- now listen, 300 yards is pretty solid. I mean, especially if, actually, I'll, I'll really take that considering the Lions going into that game with the number one offense in the National Football League. So if you can hold them to 300 yards, I'll definitely take that. And then obviously on top of that, Holding them to zero points is something to really be proud of. Again, is this a Patriots offensive win or is this a Patriots defensive win? Now, obviously, football is a team sport, so we got to give credit where credit's due on both sides. However, again, the statistics don't show you that it was a 29 nothing blowout. Again, yards, 312 Lions, P 
Patriots 364. Check mark Patriots. I'm not going to tally the check marks. Passing yards 188 to the Detroit Lions, 211. Could you say because the Patriots had a couple short fields? They had the turnover, uh, the interception thrown by Zappi. You know, obviously they had a much better day on the ground. Okay, whatever. But hey, 211 passing yards to uh, the Lions. I'll definitely take that. But again, what are we expecting in Bailey Zappi's first career start? Are we going to accept 188 passing yards? I'd say so. Rushing yards, 167. Lions, 101. Yards per play, 6.5, which I think is probably one of the most impressive statistics on this board compared to the Detroit Lions, 4.9. However, the Lions were still able to get five yards a play. It's not like you completely shut them down. They were able to get five yards per play. They had 17 first downs to the Patriots, 22. Third down efficiency, the Lions were 4 and 12, 25%. The Patriots were 3 of 9, 33%. So not that much discrepancy there. The Lions obviously had three more opportunities than you, and they converted one more. However, you only went three of nine. I mean, it, it's it's close. I mean, it's not like, again, it's not like you completely shut them down. I mean, on third down, you did pretty well. On fourth down, you did even better. They're 0-6, 0-6 on fourth down. Patriots did an attempt a fourth down conversion. Patriots had 56 total plays. The Lions had 64. Sacks allowed two. Uh, punts, these are all for the Lions, two. Total plays, Patriots had 56. Zero sacks allowed, uh, two punts. And I think the sacks allowed is a very key thing. Very key thing. Again, is this the Patriots offense we're giving credit to? Or is this showing how bad the Lions defense is? Mac Jones not once had a clean pocket when, you know, when he was playing for the first few weeks. And it showed. He got injured. He got hit. He was throwing interceptions. He was fumbling. And it shows when we have a clean pocket, we can make plays. We can make plays. And I'm really impressed with the fact that the Patriots were able to give Zappi a clean pocket because otherwise that game could have been an absolute disaster. It really could have been. And I really want to know, and people are, ooh, Bailey Zappi, Bailey Zappi, Bailey Zappi. Well, what would what Mac would have looked like? If he was in that position, clean pocket and such, I think he would have looked pretty good, in my humble opinion. But anyways, let me, um, let's see here. Hold on. Do, do, do. Hold on I'm just trying to find uh, some additional stats here. Um, hold on. I can't find this collegiate stats. That's really what I want. College stats. Here we go. Okay, perfect. Here we go. All right. Anyways, I'll, I'll get into the whole Bailey Zappy thing in, in a moment or two. Uh, let's see. Penalty yards. Lions had seven for 82 yards. Patriots had six for 46 yards. So it's good to see that get way cut down. Fumbles lost. The Lions had one. Patriots had zero. Interceptions thrown one. Patriots had one. Time of possession, 31 minutes, 29 seconds for the Patriots. 28 minutes, 31 seconds for the Detroit Lions. So again, what I was going to at the beginning... The discrepancy of this win isn't far drastic as you may think. The Lions still had over 300 yards. They still had over 200 passing yards. They had over 100 rushing yards. And they almost had five yards per play. I think if I said, would you accept 300 total yards for your team? Would you accept 200 passing yards? Would you accept 100 rushing yards? And would you accept five yards per play? I think everybody would say yes for their team. Yes, I will take that. Yes, I will take that. But the Lions were able to get all of that. They were. So again, this circles back to the question, is this a Patriots defensive win? Is this a Patriots offensive win? Is this a Detroit Lions defensive loss? Or is it a Detroit Lions offensive loss? Again, first down, they had 17 of them. They were 25% on third down. That could have been a little bit better. Uh, penalties were roughly the same. You know, Lions had seven, Pets had six. Yardage was a little different. Time of possession, very close. Three minutes was the difference there. I mean, for a team that scored 29 points, you would have thought they had the ball for 40 minutes. Nope. It was almost split in half. Almost split in half. Interceptions, same thing, one and one. Fumble, uh, the fumble six at the, uh, I think it was Judon. Judon picked that up and scored. 
Uh, let's see, Patriots. Fum oh, no, it's only going to show me interceptions. I think Judon had the, the fumble six. So it's like there's seven points right there on a fumble six. So that's not even passing. So, again, are we going to say that the Patriots scored 21 points against the worst defense in the league and be proud of that? I mean, let's just think here. Let's Let's just put our thinking caps on. Because the way I'm looking at this is, uh, granted, you had a rookie quarterback making his first career start. I will accept 17 to 21, 188 yards, a touchdown, and a pick. I will take that any day of the week for my quarterback's first career start. But again, you scored one touchdown against the worst defense in the league. Then you scored a fumble six. Okay, let's not count that for a moment. And you were able to move the ball. I will give you credit. You were. But again, you weren't able to capitalize on touchdowns. Nick Folk, your kicker, went 5 of 5 with 100% kicking percentage. He alone scored 17 points. Him alone scored 17 of your points. Then you have the Bailey Zappi touchdown, and then you have the, uh, the defensive fumble 6. So how impressed, after all of that, Oh, and of course, Ramondre Stevenson, I'm, I'm impressed with Stevenson's uh, rushing totals. He had 25 carries for 161 yards, no touchdowns. I love Myers, seven receptions, 111 yards, one touchdown. I love that. Love that a lot. I like Bailey Zappi's stat line. I can live with that. That's what I want from a first uh, rookie quarterback's first start. But how much in love am I in this win for the Patriots? How impressed am I supposed to be? Oh, the Patriots shut out the number one scoring team. They're back on track. 29-0 zipped out the Lions. Oh, my God. Look at this great game in the red jerseys. I mean, am I really supposed to be, you know, you who over this game? Like, really? Am I really supposed to be you who over this game? Because the way I see it, when you got the opportunities to march down the field, with the exception of one drive that scored in the, the Jacoby Myers touchdown, you only walked away with three points. You only were able to walk away with three points. Now listen, points points are better than no points. I, I will give you that. Points are better than no points. But I mean, Nick Folk went five for five on field goals. He scored 15 points on field goals and then two points on two PATs. That's the 17 total. But 15 points in just field goals alone. Take that out, you win 14 nothing. Take the fumble six out, you're winning seven nothing. So how effective was your offense? How excited should we really be for Bailey Zappi? Do we really want Bailey Zappi to be the quarterback moving forward? Now listen, if Mac Jones isn't 100%, absolutely. 100%. But the discussion and the argument that Bailey Zappi should be the quarterback over a healthy Mac Jones is criminal. It makes absolutely zero sense to me. Bailey Zappi, I will admit, he looked great in Lambeau going in, filling in for Brian Hoyer. He kept us in that game, putting us in a position to win. Bailey Zappi's first career start, he did exactly what he needed to do. He managed the game. He only turned the ball over once. He marched down the field. He put points on the board, whether it was through a touchdown or a field goal. So I'm not criticizing Bailey Zappi. I'm not. I'm criticizing the Patriots because this win isn't as impressive as you guys may think. The Lions, yes, did give up 29 points to the Patriots, who are the Lions, are the worst defensive team in football. They gave up 29 points to you. In other, ow, I just hit my, I hit my hand on my desk. In, in other games, in the other four games besides the 29-0 loss to the Patriots on week five, they've given up 38 points to the Eagles, 27 points to the Commanders, 28 points to the Vikings, and 48 points to the Seattle Seahawks. The Commanders, who just got a win last night on Thursday Night Football, you know, whoop de doo but we're 1-4 going into that game, who are now 2-5. and five. The Vikings, I need to look up the Vikings, actually. I don't even know what their record is. Um, They are, well, they're first in the uh, NFC North. They are 4-1, and one, so, I mean, that could be an impressive win. We Obviously, we'll have to wait and see. But by that time, let's see. What were the Vikings at that time? It was week three. 
uh, preseason, preseason. They were one and zero, one and one. They were one and one at that time. Again, the Commanders have they have good playmakers, but they have a poor quarterback, and they still were able to get twenty seven points. Eagles are the Eagles. They got thirty eight points. The Seahawks, the Seahawks, Geno Smith, in that company put up forty eight points. Kirk Cousins put up twenty eight points. Yeah, and you and a backup quarterback were able to put up 29 points, yes. But again, guys, again, 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 they were still able to get 300 yards on you. They still were able to get 17 first downs. They still almost had the ball for 30 minutes, almost half the game. It's <laughs> it's just the inefficiency of the Lions offense, who was number one, couldn't get anything going. Now again, is that now let's give the Patriots credit where it's due. They had an exceptional game. I'm not going to sit here and deny that. They had an exceptional game. They got a fumble six, they got an interception, they put up a goose egg on the board for the Lions. But they still gave up 300 yards. But they only allowed 200 passing yards and only 100 rushing yards. But again, 5 yards per play, 4.9 to be exact. It's just, I want to sit here and be impressed. I want to sit here and absolutely love the performance by the Patriots as a team, as a whole. I like it. It's a lot better than if it was 29 nothing. the Lions beat you. But I'm not going to sit here in my chair, in my office, here at the shop, Murph's Cartown Sports Shop, and say that the Patriots absolutely deserve to win that game. They were by far the better team that game. And they looked so good going into week six against the Cleveland Browns, which we will get into in a moment. Because all of that is false. All of that is false. The Lions easily could have won that game if they obviously didn't give up a fumble six, if Goff didn't throw the interception. And the Lions offense was able to put points on the board. Obviously going you know, 0-6 on fourth down does not help. But again, that's... Ample opportunities for the Patriots to have a short field. And what happens if the Patriots have a short field is the field gets smaller for their offense to move, allowing kicking a field goal to be much easier or attempting to get a touchdown to be much easier. They only got one touchdown, so those field goals were very easy. All you had to do was move like you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 yards and you're in field goal range based off of the short field and kick it. So I'm not going to get all crazy about it. And so many people here at the shop are just bizarre about Bailey Zappi. Now listen, he's played well. I've already said that. I'm, I've given his credit where credit's due. But I need to have pause, and I need to give you that pause as well. I mean, oh my goodness. Um, let's see. I need to look up Western Kentucky 2021 schedule. I went over this with someone at the shop, uh, I think it was last week or maybe the other day. I'm not exactly sure. Let's see, when was their first game of the season? I'm just trying to figure it out. All right, here we go. I think this is it. All right. Bailey Zappi. Now, I know we're completely pivoting and switching gears. I like Bailey Zappi. I love what I've seen from him so far. He's done exactly what a... What is it? A fourth-round rookie quarterback could have done. So he played four years at Houston Baptist, put up some okay numbers, nothing crazy. Then he went to Western Kentucky and played 14 games there. 475 completions, 69.2%, 5,967 yards, and the uh, the record of 62 passing touchdowns that season. Okay. Hey, good numbers, right? Good, good numbers. But... Who did he play at Western Kentucky? Who did he play at Western Kentucky? Now, it's like when we're looking at Mac Jones at Alabama, Joe Burrow when he was at LSU, um, let's see, Deshaun Watson when he was at Clemson, Trevor Lawrence at Clemson. You know, we could look at all these guys. I mean, obviously, we can go Herbert with Oregon. You know, there's over and over and over and over again. We can look at this. Who did they play? How impressive were they? Were they able to get big wins? Were they able to beat top 10 teams? Were they able to at least compete with those top 10 teams? I will tell you this. 
In 2021, Western Kentucky played one ranked team all season. One ranked team. I'm going to go through their schedule, and I want you to tell me, or I want you to think to yourself, wow, I've never heard of that school before, or I've never seen that school play football. Now, for example, there's Indiana here. Obviously, we know Indiana. They're a good college basketball program. But have you seen them play college football? Okay, so let's just... How many of these schools can you decisively say have a good college football program? Like Indiana, for example. They have a good college basketball program. Football? Eh. So, you know, let, let's just kind of run through this. All right, week one. Western Kentucky beat T.N. Martin 59-21. Who the hell is T.N. Martin? Never heard of him before. All right, week two. Western Kentucky lost to Army 38-35. Week three, Western Kentucky lost to Indiana 33-31. So, so far, you know, three subpar college football programs. Army, Army, you know, has its years in and out, you know, being good and what, but, you know, for 2020 one purposes week four number nine michigan state beat western kentucky 48 31 so obviously we know michigan state has a very good football program we can confidently say that they were the number nine team at that point last year they were ranked this year and i think they've fallen off i'm not sure where they're at now so that's one legitimate opponent that we can confidently say that you know they deserve to lose okay Western Kentucky lost to UTSA 52 to 46. I couldn't even tell you who UTSA is. University of Texas San Antonio, I'm guessing. Never heard of them before. And I couldn't even tell you if they have a good college football program. Western Kentucky beat Old Dominion 53-20. Western Kentucky beat FIU 34-19. Western Kentucky beat Charlotte 45 to 13. Western Kentucky beat Middle Tennessee 48 to 21. They beat uh, Rice 42-21. Western Kentucky beat FL Atlantic 52-17. They beat Marshall 53-21. They beat UTSA again. Actually, no, they lost at uh, UTSA 49-41. And then they beat Appalachian State in the Boca uh, Rayton Bowl 59-38. So how many of those schools that they played can we confidently say have a good college football program? Or how many of those losses were against good teams? How many of their wins were against good teams? I count one, Michigan State. The purpose of my exercise here is who were they playing last year for Bailey Zappi to put up all these points to look oh so impressive for him to have all this hype? I'm not saying that I'm a hater. I'm not trying to sound like a hater. I'm just trying to pump the brakes and just slow, whoa, down. Please, just slow, whoa, 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 down. I want to stay in the realm of reality. I just want to try to stay within reality. Bailey Zappi looked great against that in that game against Michigan State. He was 46 of 64, 488 yards, and three touchdowns. He looked damn great in that game. But let's just take a look at one of these losses. Uh, Let me try to find it. The UTSA. Nope. Where's the other one? Yeah, UTSA that they lost to both times. Uh, Western Kentucky, 523 yards, five touchdowns, and a pick. But they still lost. So he's putting up these good numbers. Let's check out the game against Indiana that they lost. He had 365 yards, three touchdowns, and no interceptions. Uh, Where's one more, one more, one more, one more. The game against Army. He had 435 yards, three touchdowns, and a pick. So he did put up good statistics, guys. But against who is what I'm trying to say. In the second game against UTSA, he had 577 passing yards, four touchdowns, and two picks. Like, I mean, it's just silly the amount of passing yards you can throw for in college football because typically the the defense isn't as there like it is in the NFL. So it's a little bit easier to put up those crazy numbers. 
to put up near 6,000 passing yards, to put up 62 passing touchdowns. Again, if you throw him in the SEC, the ACC, the Pac-12, whatever, a Power 5 conference, I want to see what his numbers would have looked like. I do. I don't think they'd be nearly as good as they were when he was at Western Kentucky. So again, I'm not trying to sound like a hater. Again, I'm not trying to sound like a Debbie Downer. I want to pump the brakes, slow down, and reel it back into reality. He's a fourth-round pick for a reason. And he's been serviceable, and he will be continuing to be serviceable for a reason. But Bailey Zappi is not going to carry us to the promised land. And when Mac Jones comes back and he's healthy, he needs to be the starting quarterback. He should be the starting quarterback, and he will be the starting quarterback. Again, if Mac Jones continues to have poor performances like he did at the beginning of the season before his injury, we can reevaluate this conversation, and then we can dive into the, oh, should Bill be starting Mac Jones or Bailey Zappi here in week, I don't know, 13 of the season when you're, I don't know, 4-8 and eight or 4-8? four and seven at that point it's just calm down guys let's just bring it back reel it back into reality and just like just pause just pause i want to pick a game that they had a lot of rushing yards i want to try to see if they had a lot of rushing yards uh not in that game against charlotte the charlotte 49ers Ooh, interesting name uh, 48-21 against Middle Tennessee. Uh, no 100-yard receiver. So I'm just going to go based off of the assumption that they were a pass-heavy team. Uh, 38-35, lost to Army. They had 30, or like 40-something rushing yards. Uh, let's see, in the Boca Roten game, uh, let's see, they did have a 150-yard rusher, but they scored 59 points, guys. So, I mean, ugh. How much credibility do I take into that? Against Marshall, they had... Okay, they had over 100 rushing yards, over 150 rushing yards. I'll give them that. But again, 53-21, to 21, you were probably running the ball a lot late. Give me a close game. Give me a game that they lost. 49-41 to UTSA. They had... <laughs> wow. So this is their second matchup with UTSA that season. They lost 49-41. They ran for 26 yards that whole game <laughs> and zappy had seven carries for five yards okay interesting what about that first matchup against utsa 52 to 46 they had okay they had over 100 rushing yards okay so that's interesting it's just they're clearly not a a running team they're not and it, it doesn't matter if they are or not i'm just trying to make a point here is they were passing a lot. Let's check out the game. 48-31 against Michigan State. They had... Uh, Zabby had seven carries for negative 17 yards. Jesus. They had less than 100 yards. I, I don't want to do the math. Probably less than 80 yards in the game against Michigan State where they lost 48-31. to They weren't a, a rushing team. So they were always passing the ball. They were a pass-happy team. Allowing pass Zappy. Get it? Haha. <laughs> To be able to throw for 300, 400, 500 yards with ease and three, four, five touchdowns with ease. So it will be interesting to see what Bailey Zappi can do this week against the Cleveland Browns if he is the starter. Again, if Mac Jones is not 100% healthy, Bailey Zappi should be the starter. And I'm very excited to see what the kid can do. I'm going to stay realistic. I'm going to stay hopeful and optimistic that Bailey Zappi can get some wins for the Patriots and, and keep them in somewhat relative contention which i have low expectations for but let's shift gears here i did allude to a couple trades that the patriots should make or consider before the trade deadline that is in week nine this is an article from patriotswire.usa.today or uh, usatoday.com this was written on the 11th so just a couple days ago by cam garrity and it is titled three trades Patriots should consider making before the deadline. And I I love trades. I love the whole front office GM thing, you know, players moving, all that good stuff. So this is right up my alley. Let's get into the article. The New England Patriots have had a shaky start to the season thus far, but things could be worse. With Mac Jones on the roster, things are promising at the quarterback position. 
Even if Jones isn't an elite quarterback, he has shown that he can hang in the league as a mid-tier starter at worst. With that being said, since Jones is on a rookie contract, the Patriots should take advantage and make uh, him and make a move to bolster the roster while the opportunity to do so is affordable. All of that could go out the window when Jones when it's Jones's turn to get paid. Keep in mind, these deals are not reports and are hypothetical scenarios of players who I think would fit perfectly with this roster. Trade compensation salaries can and always will be worked out, even with Bill Belichick, the coach. Uh, there's still some time before the November 1st trade deadline, but here are three moves the Patriots should consider before making uh, before or making before that date. One, Roquan Smith, linebacker, Chicago Bears. In a previous article, I mentioned Roquan Smith as being an excellent athlete that hardly misses tackles and can provide pressure to the opposing quarterback when used correctly. New England could swing a deal for the disgruntled linebacker and add a true playmaker opposite of Matt Judon. As time goes on, compensation dwindles, with Smith potentially hitting free agency this offseason. His hypothetical trade, Patriots get Roquan Smith, Bears get a 2023 second rounder, 2023 fourth rounder, and a 2025 second rounder. And I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, the Patriots, if they give up a third instead of a second, they could add a... I'm not going to sit here and do that. I'm just... Let's just talk about talk about this. So Roquan Smith, I've loved Roquan Smith. I believe he came from Georgia. If I Roquan Smith, I believe he. Uh, yep, he's a Georgia Bulldog. I'm a big fan of of Roquan Smith. I have been, you know, since he got drafted into the league. I thought him and Khalil Mack were such a devastating duo in Chicago for the years that they played together. And the guy's right. He would be a, a true playmaker opposite of Matthew Judon, who's having a fantastic season this year. And I do think the defense is going to have to carry this team as a whole, whether Zappi's at quarterback or Max at quarterback. And if you can continue getting pressure on the quarterback like you were able to get on Jared Goff last week, who, again, the Lions were the number one team, uh, number one offense in the league. But if you can continue to do that, week in and week out with the emergence of Jack Jones and obviously the return of Jalen Mills when he gets healthy. Jonathan Jones looking good as well. I mean, it's really going to help bolster that linebacker core. It's really going to help bolster the pressure that you're giving the opposite quarterback to maybe make mistakes, whether it's fumble, whether it's throwing interceptions, or not being able to convert uh, first downs. That will all help the Patriots long term if they want any hope of relevancy this season. I think Roquan Smith would be an exceptional addition to this team uh, for all those reasons that I just mentioned. Uh, number two, uh, obviously this is no order. There's, there's, he didn't outline one, two, or three. He titled Roquan Smith. Patriots bring in Roquan Smith, and he titles the next guy a true number one for the ages, and that is DK Metcalf. DK Metcalf is everything that Nikhil Harry was supposed to be. Ironic, because DK Metcalf was drafted after Nikhil Harry. How sad is that? I, I will sit here and and cry about it because the Patriots fumbled that bag. Again, a lot of teams did too because he was the last pick in the second round. So I get it. But anyways, you know, neither here nor there. DK Metcalf is everything that Nikhil Harry was supposed to be. Metcalf is another potential target that might want out of a rebuilding situation. And Mac Jones is in need of a true number one receiver that can fit his timeline. Metcalf will cost a pretty penny in draft capital, but I am tired of worrying about value. Go get the guy and show your faith in the young quarterback. Patriots get DK Metcalf in a 2024 sixth round pick. The Seahawks get a 2023rd first round pick, 2024 second, and a 2023 fifth round pick. Now, I would obviously have to look up contractual situations, but let's see, Metcalf was drafted in 20 when was he drafted 2019 right oh god dk yeah because i was a senior at college during that draft uh let's see yep may 19 okay yeah so where's my where's my current tab here it is so let's see he played 19 20 21 so yeah he's gonna be free agent at the end of the season too and he's gonna be worth a pretty penny you know if you want to re-sign him and obviously you make these deals to re-sign these guys. Like, I, I remember when Jamal Adams got traded from the the Jets to the, the Seahawks. You know, he was going to be a free agent that year. 
and they gave up two first round picks among other stuff. And the Seahawks said like, yeah, we're trading for this guy to re-sign him. We're not trading him just to be a re- trading for him, giving up all these assets just for a rental. I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more. And if you're going to give up a first round pick and a second round pick to get a guy, then you absolutely need to re-sign him. Again, he's a freakish athletic talent that will definitely help you on the outside. It'll allow Myers to play on the inside. You can have Bourne play on the inside. Again, I was saying when the Patriots brought in Devontae Parker, this is what I said, is he's not a true number one receiver. He had one nice year, maybe two nice years, where he put up you know some good numbers. But he's not a true number one wide receiver. He's a gr- really good second and a great third. Obviously, he's in the grand scheme of things, he's probably going would be a uh, second wide receiver. I think that's where he, he kind of fits best. And I was saying that Devontae Parker, and if you've been listening to the podcast for weeks and months now, you would know I've said this time and time again. I've even if you come by the shop, I've even said this numerous times at the shop to people. Is Devontae Parker comes to your team and is automatically defaulted a number one wide receiver. Although he shouldn't be. But it allows Jacoby Myers and Kendrick Bourne to be twos and threes, which they are. Because last year you had Jacoby Myers and Kendrick Bourne as, you know, your one and your two, you know, flip flop them however you want, and they're not. Jacoby Myers is emerging as an excellent number two wide receiver. Uh, Kendrick Bourne, a low end two, maybe a a third wide receiver at best. But last year, he had to be a number one. Devontae Parker takes the number uh, number one corner of the opposing team to him, like Marlon Humphrey with the the Ravens uh, a couple uh, couple weeks ago. And it allows Jacoby Myers and Kendrick Bourne to do their own thing under the middle or on the outside, wherever. Same thing would happen with DK. However, DK is a true number one wide receiver who can take on true number one corners of the opposing team and win and put up good statistics. So I would absolutely love and accept a trade, especially a first round pick where Bill Belichick has struggled on first round picks in recent drafts. I mean, can we just, I don't want to do it again, but I'm going to do it again. I hate doing it, but I'm going to do it. I'm just going to talk about first-round picks. I've talked about recent Patriots drafts numerous times, and it's disgusting because they're so bad. Now again, 2022, Cole Strange, can't tell yet. No idea just yet. You know, he may be a great player. He may suck. Who knows? But so far, he's off to a great start, I'd say. Uh, Mac Jones, obviously, obviously still need to wait. We will have to wait and see about that. But so far, hopefully that's a hit. Uh, let's see, 2020, there was no first-round pick. 2019, Akil Harry, yikes. 2018, Sony Michelle, not even on the team anymore. I, I guess, yeah, but you could have had Nick Chubb. I mean, that that's the biggest thing is you could have took Nick Chubb instead. Isaiah Wynn, who looked like he was going to be a hit, but he's kind of fallen off the face of the earth. Uh, 2017, you didn't have one. 2016, you didn't have one. 2015, you had Malcolm Brown, kind of sucked. Uh, Dominic Easley in 2014 sucked. 2013 didn't have one. 24, uh, 2012, you had Chandler Jones and Dante Hightower. Bang, bang, winning hits. Winning, winning hits. And Chandler Jones is not even on the team anymore, and he hasn't been for a long time. And Dante Hightower is not even on the team anymore either. Uh, let's see, Nate Solder in 2011, that was a hit. Devin McCourty in 2010, that was a hit. Uh, 20, uh, 2009, no. 2008, Gerard Mayo, that was a hit. 2007, okay, we're getting too far back. But that was Brandon Merriweather. He was, nah, nah, he was nah. I didn't really like him. Not a first-round guy. Anyways, so how long ago did I say that was a hit? Uh, I mean, that I could confidently say that was a hit. Was that really Chandler Jones and Dante Hightower in 2012? Is that really the last time that I can sit here confidently say that's a win? Yeah, I think so. I think so, because I'm not going to give Isaiah Wynn and Sonny Michelle credit because they suck now. Sonny Michelle's on his, what, fourth team or, or whatever. Uh, he was good his rookie season. That was it. Isaiah Wynn, uh, with injuries, struggled to get onto the field, and he sucks right now. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, you had Mac Jones and Cole Strange the past couple drafts, but we still need to wait and see. I love the upside. I love the optimism behind them, but we have to wait and see about that one. So trading a first-round pick for a bona fide stud who, you know, physically should have been a first-round pick. 
I'll take that any day of the week. And the third one is Patriots add underutilized weapon to the offense. If the Patriots don't wind up getting DK Metcalf, there's another disgruntled star wideout that is being used less and less each week in DJ Moore, who has dealt with terrible quarterback play for his entire career. The 25-year-old is on the books for another three seasons at $20 million per year and change and could be traded with his disengagement in Carolina. The Panthers are having issues with quarterback play and coaching at this point, and Moore could force his way out. It would be a perfect opportunity for Belichick to swoop in and give the star a new home along with gifting Jones a trusted number one wideout. Patriots get DJ Moore. The Panthers would get a 2023 second round pick, 2024 third, and a 2025 second round pick. Now, good thing here is you don't have to trade a first round pick. Bad thing is he's already on the books for $20 million. So you have to obviously pay him the $20 million, which compared to some of the wideouts that have been signing recently, Devontae Adams, Tyree Kill, that's kind of a almost a budget option, to be honest. Now, obviously, we don't know what DK Metcalf's contract is going to be worth, and you would have to give up a first-round pick for him. Now, would you rather get a, a player who's a star, but a step back from DK, have to give up less, but he's already you know, making the big money? Or would you rather give up more and get a guy that isn't locked up long-term, but has a higher ceiling? That's a conversation for you guys. I mean, we could talk about this, you know, next week. I do want to move on to the Patriots and Browns, but this is something to strongly consider because obviously they're both good players. They both will help out the team immensely. I personally would like to have DK under the assumption that we can extend him long term and that's not going to break the bank. Whereas at least DJ Moore, $20 million isn't going to break the bank. But I definitely want to hear what you guys have to say about this. Did I miss a player that the Patriots should be looking for? On the trade market, obviously there was two wide receivers and a linebacker. Could we go after a different linebacker, a different edge threat, or maybe we should be going after a running back with Damian Harris potentially missing some time? Let me know. Reach out to me via social media at Murph's Car Town. I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. If you're listening to this on YouTube, definitely drop your comments down below as I can't wait to read and reply to those as well. However, we do have a few more minutes left. Let's talk about the Patriots and the Browns. Week 6 matchup between the two teams in Cleveland, Ohio. Number 1. What am I looking for number 1? Well, it's going to be the same thing that I was looking for last week with Zappi and the Lions is for Bailey Zappi to go out there, manage the game, don't turn the ball over, and just make the right plays. That's it. Plain and simple. Next, <laughs> Number two, I want to see what the running back situation is going to look like with Damian Harris potentially missing time. Will Ramondre Stevenson really step up and just explode with the true opportunity to be a number one running back? I, I'm very excited to see that. Obviously, you know, what's the running back rotation going to look like? You know, are you going to utilize Pierre Strong, Kevin Harris, and or just, you know, Ramondre Stevenson. Obviously, Ty Montgomery is still out, I do believe. Uh, who the Patriots used last week? They used Stevenson, Harris, Zappi, and then Kendrick Bourne on, a, on like a jet sweep. So it'll be very interesting to see what they do. Could we see some jet sweeps with uh, John O. Smith if he's healthy? Could we obviously see it with Kendrick Bourne? I'm definitely curious what to see or, or to see how the offense is going to kind of formulate, obviously with Zappi being my number one thing to look for, and obviously the running back room, specifically Ramondre Stevenson being the number two. Number three thing to look for in this game between the Browns and the Patriots is, of course, the defense. Can they duplicate the exceptional play, again, or quote-unquote exceptional play against the Detroit Lions um, that they had against the Detroit Lions here against the Browns? Obviously, I don't expect another shutout. I don't. But I definitely would like to see uh, them slow down Nick Chubb. Obviously, you know, show that Jacoby Brissett isn't a great quarterback, that he has his own limitations. Maybe take advantage of the fact that you're playing against Jacoby Brissett and not a guy like Deshaun Watson. They don't have the greatest receiving room. You know, Mari Cooper's all up and down and all around. So can you shut him down? I think this could be a really good game for the defense. Could this be a potential trap game for the Patriots? Of course. Of course. I had the Patriots. I think I had the Patriots winning last week. Excuse me, but I wasn't sold on it. I really wasn't sold on it. There was a world that the Lions could win. I already talked about it. 
there's a world that the Browns could win. There is. And I wouldn't be surprised if they do because they do have a good team. They got a nice little defense. They got a good line, actually a great line. And, you know, they do have some playmakers on offense. Chubb, Hunt, Cooper, uh, Peoples-Jones. Obviously, Jacoby Brissett playing pretty good this year. So it'll be very interesting to see how this game goes out. So those are the three things that I'm looking for in this game between the Browns and the Patriots. I'll recap them. Number one, Bailey Zappi, managing the game. Don't make mistakes. Make the right plays. Number two, what is the running back room going to look like on Sunday? Will we see Stevenson really take that step being a number one? Is Harris going to be ruled out? If he is, what is the running back rotation going to look like? And then, of course, number three that I just talked about, defense duplicating their performance against the Browns like they had last week against the Lions, making key stops, turning the ball over, and just really preventing uh, the Browns from getting anything going on offense. But that is going to wrap it up for today's episode, guys. I really hope you enjoyed today's episode. I really want to truly dive into the Patriots, which is kind of a common theme now as we're in the heart and soul of the season. I know I mentioned I was going to talk about the Bruins last week, and I think I even said I was going to talk about the Celtics last week. Bruins looked fantastic. Uh, game one against the Capitals, winning 5-2. to two. I'll be very excited to see what that team looks like, obviously, over the course of a couple weeks and even a couple months when the... Um, when they get some of their stars back from injury. But scraping out as many points as you can early in the season is going to be huge down the road because we saw that the Patri uh, Patriots, well, that the Bruins weren't able to win these games in overtime or even force these games into overtime, missing out on that extra point. And that was truly the difference between the teams that were ahead of them in the standings to them because all those other teams had, you know, a, you know 10 overtime losses, but the Bruins only had two. And that's a difference of eight points right there. So I am definitely eager to see what the Bruins can look like short term and just kind of hopefully they can keep the boat afloat until, like I said, the stars come back, uh, Marshan, McAvoy, and others. But that is going to do it for today's episode, guys. I really appreciate you downloading, listening, and joining on all audio platforms Is that is if that is where you're listening to Murph's and Boston Sports Talk. I appreciate every single buddy for supporting the podcast ever since its inception to the current day. I do, do want to have something special, not for like a special episode or anything. Um, I'm currently working on my Teespring website just to kind of promote a bunch of different uh, memorabilia, not memorabilia, uh, apparel per se with shop shirts, podcast shirts, and just different stuff like that that I really want to pump out there for you guys. For those that are listening maybe outside of the New England region and can't make it to the shop, uh, it's something that I've been working on. I worked on it all day yesterday. I plan on working on it all day today, but that is something that I'm currently working on in the background. But just wait. It's not ready yet, but it will be very, very soon. Hopefully by the time you hear next week's episode, it will be. But yes, thank you guys so much for listening to this on YouTube. If that's where you're listening it to, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe as I greatly appreciate the love and support that way. But that is going to do it for today's episode. Have a fantastic weekend. Enjoy college football on Saturday. Enjoy the NFL on Sunday. And enjoy the hockey season being back. Oh, wait, of course. Don't forget, enjoy the MLB playoffs if your team is still in it. Obviously, the Red Sox aren't. whip de doo that is going to do it for this one, guys. I will catch you in the next one. But between now and then, you guys know that I love you. And I will always, always see you.